plot produced by a tool called RUL, R-R-U-L, specification and process, showing what actually happens in terms of bandwidth with two competing streams. I'm going to try to explain. Both streams in this particular token, we start off with a simple ping, which is not measured in megabits per second, it's just ping. We're measuring on this side, we're measuring the overall latency of the ping flow. And over on this side, we're measuring the bandwidth being used by the system. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So we start with ping being really, really nice and low latency. It's running at less than 2 ms here. And at time plus t, we hit 5 seconds. Time plus t, yeah, t plus 5. We start up two TCP streams, one in each direction in this particular test. And they hit slow start, that's what these two things here are. And on one side or the other, we finally hit the length of the queue. And we drop the packet. So they happen so fast that what you just see is this sort of behavior. This is over almost three seconds. You see it trying to find an optimal point and jittering back and forth until both links manage to use all the bandwidth on the connection. Now, unfortunately, that, that works great. That's according to theory. If that did not happen, the internet would not have come back to life in 1985, and you guys would not have your Android and iPhones, and we'd probably all be still sending email by the post and so on, because the internet was dead then. But the behavior of the P5 go fast is classic drop tail, and you'll see how the latency of the pink packet, it oscillates a little bit where packet must be. Dang <laughs> Where packet loss is happening, so our round trip time for ping has increased from 2 ms to 44, and by the time this reaches the optimal point using a completely full queue, we are looking at 78 ms worth of delay at 10 megabit. Now these are related to the size of your queue, as well as to the speed you're running at. So if you had one megabit at home, which I guess over half of you do, and this was happening, and you had a thousand buffers in your queue, this would not be 78 ms, this would be 780 ms. And that's, if you're running at half that speed, which it sounded like half, although many of you were, we're looking at over a second, and at 1.2 seconds, 1.4 seconds, that range, worth of delay in your own system making your initial session start for web traffic, making your DNS look up slow, making your gaming packet slow, etc. Still, we have to have a queue. The size of the queue is a problem. If you have a too small a queue, um, what happens, and you should do this one, this is, this is spontaneous, hold out that spoon, pour a little bit into that spoon. Okay. You know, too small a queue, and you can't provide a signaling that's long enough to get across your point. You put it in. Signal happens, you drop, you drop packets, and it will end up being very polluted. Thank you. So, um, from the original internet, we have gone to where we have speeds from 100 kilobit to 10 plus 10 GB. We're looking at 100 GB now, and yet portions of the world are running over very slow serial lengths, etc. And we have all sorts of new performance enhancing things for TCP, things like IW10, and stuff that network offloads that take uh, packets that are in your system, combine them in one really large super packet, and ship them into the network card all in one big burst. And then there's Wi Fi, and I don't want to really talk about that yet. So the point is that there is no one right size for the queue. Now, they did notice back then when they first started working on the red algorithm, that what would happen if you had multiple TCPs happening, I demonstrated it earlier, TCP global synchronization, where it's pouring so much packets into a large queue that they all collapse simultaneously. So this is what TCP global synchronization looks like. This is normal TCP, this is not global. And you'll see that all these TCP streams peak and then collapse. Peak and then collapse. So the bandwidth that you could otherwise have been using right about here all vanishes. The utilization of your network is nowhere near as good as it could be. So having seen that problem, uh, a whole bunch of people after the internet got rebooted started working on 
uh, ways of managing the cube length. The first algorithm that I'm aware of is called RED. There was uh, blue, there's a half dozen major variants, it's a thing called PI controller. There's hundreds and hundreds of papers written on these subjects, all with the sets of ideas that look like on paper they work. Um, and it turned out that nearly all of them are really hard to configure. And uh, they weren't dynamic, you could bandwidth change, they didn't do anything, and uh, almost all of them were really bad for voice over IP traffic because you needed to have special classification. A whole bunch of research went into that. And we still had latency spikes. But at least we got rid of the drop tail problem and introduced all sorts of new introductory and interesting ones. Now, I actually had a demo. Where did my sharp object go? They shouldn't let me have sharp objects. <laughs> <laughs> Could you hold this for a second? Blue, orange, 
and I got her. Okay? I got her each, and I now have the Scholastic Fair Queuing Girls live in Italy. Okay? You have your things there? So, what will happen as I'm going to talk about this one now? In the real world, in SFQ, there are up to 64K worth of flows. Uh, since I can only get two volunteers for this, you know, we're only going to have two flows. But we're going to simulate the effect of the other 1024 uh, flows by putting our little eyedroppers um, into a separate bucket. So you're going to put your eyedropper packet there, it flows here. Go ahead, I'll try to talk to it when you go. So put your eyedropper there. Cool. DNS. Next, we're going to have our sins. Cool. And then each of you are going to slowly pour information into there. Oops. Did you guys forget the step? There we go. Okay. And great. Those two flows are operating independently of each other. And um, this means that put more eyedroppers there. Keep putting your like, keep pouring. <laughs> Okay, that these means at least jump to the head of the queue. They, they don't have any of the latency these two guys go. And then this guy here is capable of handling whatever happens from there. So you keep putting your eye drop, new streams, keep starting 100 plus streams of web traffic. You do this great, but it has one flaw. Keep going yourself. Okay, core fast. So she's doing her thing, doing other stuff over here. Go ahead. There, keep pouring, squeeze, and we still have the drop tail problem on elephant flows. So you get that signal back, and we have memory issues, and we have this long-term signaling problem now introduced in not just one, but any queues that have an elephant flow in them. So let them drink. Thank you. Actually, you can sit down for a little bit. Now, it looks like I'm going to run a little over time. I have till 4 o'clock. Yes? I have till 4? Excellent. Good. So, a lot of people beat their brains out over this kind of stuff for a long time. You'll see that um, the Linux community in particular, but anybody developing routers discovered that you could apply some combination of these techniques and get lower latency and better throughput, but it was never easy to configure. Um, and in particular, there was a wonderful uh, program that came out that people got religious about called Wondershaper, which applied stochastic fair queuing to a set of um, HTB bins, um, a, a rate limiting bin, and uh, also did some optimization based on the size and type of typical packets at the time, and it worked spectacularly well for the kind of traffic you saw at the time. The typical web page back then was about 70K in size. And the typical bandwidth back then was far less than half a megabit. 